know, this past month, we've been kind of camped out in the same place, even though it's various characters that are interacting within this, this larger play. We've been watching the rise of the Babylonian Empire uh, go from one of, of three powers within the region around the people of Judah to becoming the lone superpower almost overnight. And if you read on throughout history and see, you'll see that, that Babylon almost comes up and, and springs out of nowhere and, and remains dominant for a period of about 70 years. And then as fast as it goes up, it, it quickly is diminished from Cyrus, the king that comes in and, and takes over. And it was almost as if God chose for Babylon to come to power and, and to rise to this position of influence in order to carry out his plans and his prophecies for his people. Sure, it was just a coincidence. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Daniel. The book of Daniel comes after Ezekiel. So we're working our way through, and we're in the, the second half of Scripture, if you're following along. And though we've spent the past two weeks in the book of Ezekiel, Daniel actually predates uh, his contemporary by a few years. So if you look here, it's kind of a confusing chart, but Daniel sits right in here between Jeremiah and Ezekiel. So there's some overlap there, but Daniel's ministry obviously spans much longer than the other two. So this is actually backing up to go to the, the story of Daniel here. But uh, when Ezekiel does join Daniel in Babylon, he, he, Daniel goes off in, in, in the first wave, which we're going to talk about this morning. But when Ezekiel comes in in 593 B.C., he goes and, and preaches primarily in the rural areas and allows Daniel to keep prophesying and serving there in, in, uh, within the palace there in the capital city. So you've got two people that are working and, and trying to accomplish things. They're doing them in two geographically different areas. So all this is, is happening. Well, during this first wave of, of deportations, 12 years earlier before Ezekiel gets there, uh, then Prince Nebuchadnezzar, he, he's kind of uh, serving as, as head of the military at this point. He goes and he surrounds Jerusalem. He's got him where he wants him. They're building their siege ramps and everything is, is taking place. He gets word from back uh, in, in the homeland that his father, the king, has passed away. And so he's got to go back and, and, and kind of uh, pick up the pieces and attend to the affairs of the state. And so he's right in the big middle of this, and so he can't just leave and say, well, I'll be back. You guys hang, hang tight. So to show King Jehoiakim that, that he's serious about what his intentions are, he goes in, and he goes into Judah's capital, and, and he takes with him a little over 70 hostages, and he also takes with him the holy things from the temple. And if you go back and, and reread from 2 Chronicles chapter 4, you'll see the laundry list of everything that was put into Solomon's temple. And this was an incredible list of things that they were carrying off. And, and, and just the things that they didn't tear off the wall, just the implements they used for worship, incredible amount of value because of the precious metals and, and the candlesticks and the bowls and everything else that, that's going on. They can quickly grab these things and take them back. And, uh, it, but it's more than just the value of the gold, which is tremendous. It's also communicating to the people there in Judah, but also to the people in Babylon where they're returning, we are victorious. And this Yahweh that these Jewish people are worshiping, obviously he's not as great. He's not as powerful as the gods that we worship back here in Babylon. This is very important because they would take these implements in and they would actually uh, set them up in, in mocking ways, bowing down to their gods, saying, these are the things they use in their worship now. We're going to make fun of these things in our worship. So that's the thing that, that's going on. So they go in. Okay, so we talked about these, these things that were used in, in the temple. But who were these hostages? Who were these ones that they took back on this first wave? In reality, they target the best of the best. And these are people that they're going to not go and, and kill and, and hang up and say, look, they, these are examples. We're going to grab the best and the brightest in order for us to use and to train them to serve within the royal court. A few years ago, when Hong Kong uh, went back to China, there was what they called the brain drain, where a lot of the best and brightest and talented folks weren't sure what it was going to look like, so they left. 
Well, in reality, they're taking out the next generation of leaders by taking this 70 back with them. So they're pulling out the best and the brightest from among them. Okay, well, let's look at, at who these people were, some of their characteristics. Daniel chapter 1 and verse 3 tells us they were sons of nobility in the royal family. So uh, if they're going to serve in the palace and, and serve the, the king, it kind of makes sense that we pick some folks that this isn't going to be second nature to, that, that they've kind of grown up doing this. Verse 4 tells us that they were the young. The Hebrew word yaladim refers to someone generally within the literature of someone that's 14 to 17. So we usually don't think of, of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego as being teenagers but probably in reality, they were very young. They, these are high school age guys that they're seeing some potential here. And they, they've come from royalty. And we're going to pull them out of their families and take them back with us. Well, the text also tells us they were handsome without physical defect. They were good looking. I mean, these were studs. They were well built. It said they were without handicapped or blemish. And in ancient Middle Eastern courts, it it was kind of customary that you would find attractive people that are going to be serving within the palace. And so they they pick out those that that don't have any physical defects. Okay? And so they let only the good-looking people serve as the king's attendants. And notice that this is a value that the world puts tremendous amount of, of emphasis on. And it still continues to today. Notice that physical appearance is never something that God proclaims or God lifts up. In fact, it's just the opposite. God says, I I look at what's going on the inside. You guys spend entirely too much time and money and everything else keeping that exterior. Boy, physical training is of value, but spiritual training, that's what you need to be focused on. So definitely the world sees this as something that's important. The text also tells that they were smart. Not only in their knowledge they had already mastered up to this point as 14 to 17 year olds, you know, they, they, they've accomplished some things, but also they're not remedial learners here. They, they've got an aptitude to be able to learn more things because that's exactly what's going to happen. So they need someone that can quickly assimilate new material. So the only the, the brightest. So it says that they were quick to understand. Some texts say that, that they can master the sciences and not just chemicals and stuff, but able to assimilate uh, information and put facts together and to mass new information and be able to, to do this. And finally, there was a social component. These were folks that were not awkward. They had some type of a personality and uh, didn't have that, that quirk that would make them stand out within the palace. The, these are uh, young men that had tact and self-confidence in a winning personality so they could be highly presentable to, to serve before the king. So these were the guys that, that they handpicked and said, we're going to take you back to Babylon. We're going to give you a whole new life. We're going to give you a whole new job as well. So they enrolled these exiles in what I call the University of Babylon, which at that time was the center of the educational world. They're the most advanced society going. And these guys have the opportunity to walk in and receive training that a lot of people in Babylon didn't even have access to. That's how incredible this situation was. The text tells us it was a three-year college in which they would be enrolled to learn language and the literature of the Babylonian culture. What they were learning was the Chaldean language. And this was very difficult because they're going to have these cuneiform characters. I probably just butchered that. But it's different symbols that meant different parts of the sentence. So they've got these clay tablets, and they're trying to figure this thing up. It's a very difficult language to learn, especially going from Hebrew. We, we have the Magi that are mentioned in Matthew chapter 2. Scholars believe that this, these were the Chaldeans. These are the wise, me, uh, wise men that we read about that came to, to visit uh, the baby Jesus. So they're going to learn from the wisest people on the planet. That's the opportunity that's been given before them. Well, the literature is, is, is not just, um, you know, reading different stories and poems and stuff. They're going to be learning about astronomy. They're going to be learning about astrology and alchemy and medicine and, and architecture. King Nebuchadnezzar is, is known for these incredible hanging gardens. Well, different people had hanging gardens, but his were known worldwide because he had developed a system of air conditioning. Don't know how. I, I probably should have spent more time looking at that. 
I thought it was pretty interesting. They've already mastered this. So this is a, a much more advanced society than what they've grown up in at the time. So this is the culture they're being dropped into. So you know that these, these Hebrew boys, as, as they're being escorted in, their eyes are about this big, and they're just soaking all this in. And that's exactly what the king wants them to do, to soak this in. And it seems like quite an investment that they would be making in some POWs. They don't see these as prisoners of war. They see these as young men that they're going to be serving, not as cupbearers and bakers, but they're going to help these guys become wise men and advisors, that they're totally sold out, they're totally disconnected from family, and they're in this palace, and this is their life. So they're trying to prepare them for this. So the king grabbing them at such a young age was very intentional because they're young enough I mean, they're old enough that they can be taken away from their family, but they're young enough that they can still develop new patterns of thought. They're still open to learning new things because they're going to be, in a sense, brainwashing them into the Babylonian society. So they could walk around outwardly with the appearance of being a Hebrew. They're going to stand out. But inwardly, inwardly, that's what they're trying to work upon. And they're trying to say, we want you to think and act and have the same values as the Babylonians that you'll be serving. So that's what's going. That's what the mission is, to mold their minds and shape them into Babylonians. We're going to see God allow these teens to be put into position, not to do that, but to show His dominance and Yahweh's control, even when His people, the people of Judah, are out of control. God's still going to be pulling the strings, and still going to be orchestrating things, even the most incredible situation that they find themselves in, in the palace of the most powerful man in the whole world, can't compare with what God's going to do through these boys, in particular, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Daniel. So that's what's happening, kind of setting the stage here. Well, how did Nebuchadnezzar go about this indoctrination, this transformation? Daniel chapter 1 and verse 3 says this, Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, chief of his court officials, to bring in some of the Israelites from the royal family and nobility. Anyone got the King James Version with you this morning? It's okay. Okay. Totally different meaning if you read it here. And the king spake until Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel and the king's seed and of the princes. So the king, according to the King James Version, instructs the official in charge of the eunuchs, go pick out some new recruits to join your troops. These guys were made eunuchs? We simply don't know. The scholars are divided on this, and I wrestle with even mentioning it. But the Hebrew term translated court official in the NIV can also be used for eunuchs. But consider this, for those of you that, that are kind of doubting, and I, I'm not com completely convinced, but this story kind of makes me lean that direction. If we're reading uh, through the, the story of the kings of, of Judah and Israel, we've got the second kings, there was a good king in Judah that we read about, his name was Hezekiah. And Hezekiah basically did what was right and proper for the Lord. And, and, and the prophet Isaiah goes in and, and talks to King Hezekiah, and he says, man, you need to get your house in order. You're sick. And you're not going to pull out of this. So Hezekiah's like, what's the deal? I've been faithful. So he lifts up prayers unto the Lord and says, Lord, I've been a good king. Think of all the other guys that have gone before me. I've tried to do what's right. I made some mistakes. I'm human. So the Lord grants his request. And I'm not even sure if Isaiah was even home when he's sent back in. He goes, well, the, the Lord apparently heard. And he's going to give you another 15 years. So the king's like, Yes. And I, I really don't know why we, we want to stay around here longer instead of getting on to heaven. But that's a totally different sermon. But he asked for this time. The Lord says, I'm going to give you 15 more years. Well, a few weeks later, this envoy from Babylon comes in. And they're their allies at the time. But they came by to bring some gifts. We, we heard you were sick, and so we wanted to check in on you. He goes, hey, I got this great story. I prayed to God. God healed me. And hey, while you're here, let me show you everything the Lord's done to bless his people. So he takes them through the palace, entertaining them. He goes over to the storehouses. He goes, look at all this gold. 
Look at all this silver. Look, look at all this, these fine spices and everything. And, and, and look at our weapons. Look, look at everything we have. This is what God has done for us. And the guys are like taking notes, okay? 47 shields, and you're going here and writing all this stuff down. Well, the prophet Isaiah comes back in after the envoy leaves, and he goes, Has a guy, who were those guys? Well, there was, they were just some, some nice guys that came to visit from Babylon. And he said, You have made a mistake. What exactly did you show them? Well, I showed them all the Lord has blessed us with. 2 Kings 20, verses 17 and 18 says this, The the time will surely come when everything in your palace and all that your fathers have stored up until this day will be carried off to Babylon. Nothing will be left. And this happens, says Lord. And some of your descendants, your own flesh and blood, young men within your royal family that will be born to you will be taken away. And they will become eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. 150 years before the time of this text this morning, Isaiah is going to say, the Lord is telling you this day is coming if our people do not turn. Was, is it too much to think that these four young men were treated in this way? Well, I, if it's just too hard for you to wrap your arms around that, I'm, I'm going to give you permission to disagree with me. Because like I said, the scholars are divided. But if it's true... Isn't it just another example of what happens when we sin and we we ask forgiveness for God, but the effects of our sin carry on three and four generations, as the text tells us. So the sins of Hezekiah get played out in this generation. In a way, it kind of makes sense. If you take away the possibility these young men would have children and a family of their own, and, and, and there's no one special, no real desire for that, then... Uh, I'm just going to devote myself 100% into the service of the king. Well, in addition, part of their transformation, the king used food to kind of get them into a new way of thinking. Daniel 1 and verse 5 says this, the king assigned them daily amounts of food and wine from the king's table. Now, this is stuff that they're not used to. So they come before the king and says, well, this is what you're going to be eating. Find food and, and drink. Provide the opportunity for these young men to to kind of buy into a new lifestyle. Hey, we're, we're on vacation here, and well, not really. We're going to be serving. Might as well make the most of it. I mean, we're eating like kings. This is fantastic. If you read uh, up on, on stories of Jim Jones down in Guyana and David Koresh in Waco, both of these cult leaders used food. They also used passion, also used privileges, all these different things to shower upon their new recruits as part of his intended indoctrination and to brainwash those and to complete submission to them as leaders. So food had to play a big part of this into what they're doing. And finally, the text tells us he changed their names. You know, to change someone's name provide an opportunity for these young men to kind of change their identity. And, and that's what the king wanted. Well, you're here and you're, you're kind of going to kind of get into this. If you've ever been over to Hawaii, they'll give you a Hawaiian name so you really get into it and hang loose and stuff. You know, we really want you to buy into this whole deal and keep coming back. You know, uh, So they're, they're giving them a new name and so that they want them to assimilate into this culture and in our, our nation's history with the African slaves that come over. They didn't want them to maintain their tribal identity. They wanted them to realize you're not going back to Africa. You're not going back to that. You've got a new identity here, so therefore we're going to change your name because you, knew, you now have a new identity as a slave here on this plantation. And since assimilation was the objective, the whole procedure in which Daniel was involved, the Babylonian name would be appropriate. So let's see what their names were because they, all these boys were given good godly names that would remind them of their spiritual upbringing. And so you've got Daniel, which means God is my judge. Okay, that's very impressive. Hananiah, Jehovah is gracious. Mishael, who is like God? Azariah, Jehovah is my helper. Even within these names, their, their names could cognate into to different names of God. So they wanted, every time someone heard their name, that they would be reminded of whose they are and to whom they, they were serving. So Nebuchadnezzar is like, we can't keep reminding them that they, they worship after Jehovah. They're no longer Adonai's servants. They're my servants. Let's give them new names. And so to, to Daniel, it was Belteshazzar, 
which means Bel or God. Uh, Marduk was the prominent God there. Protect his life. You're now under his leadership. Shadrach, under the command of Aku, the moon god. Meshach, from the goddess Shak. Don't you know that they razzed him? <laughs> well, at least they're going to named after a goddess. Okay, and then Abednego, a servant of Nabu, the, the shining fire god. So you guys have someone new that's calling the shots. Someone new that's giving you your marching orders. You're no longer following after Yahweh. And then it, the intent was to meld them into the Babylonian culture. Nothing could remain that would remind them of who they are and whose they are. They didn't want them thinking about home. They didn't want them longing for the temple. The passage that the praise team read today from the Psalms where it talks about they're out there working and the exiles there. Years later, they're still singing songs from the homeland as they're digging, as they're serving. They're remembering Jerusalem. This is how important it was. And they're trying to pull them away from that. Well, how did these young men fight against this as they go off to college? They've got an incredible amount of pressure to be someone new and to be transformed into what we want you to be. How did they resist that? The first thing is the text tells us they remained obedient. And you guys need to be taking notes because y'all were going off to college a couple of years. And you've got to figure out how am I going to maintain who I am and who my parents have raised me to be. The first thing is a call to obedience. You know, for Daniel, when he heard what was on the menu the first day, he's like, um, can I pull you aside? Uh, we're not supposed to be eating this stuff, and I, I'm just not going to do it. Can, can you get me some, just some vegetables and, and water? Because I'd feel more comfortable with that. And so it became a big deal. Daniel 1 and verse 8, Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine. And he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself in this way. Well, the chief official is like going, Daniel, have you not heard about the king? This guy's brutal. He, he does stuff like drop people in oil. He throws them into the fire. He, he cuts people's heads off. And if I present you before him after you're cleaned up and, and trained and you're looking gaunt and you're looking terrible, it's not just going to be you that's in trouble. It's going to be my head on the platter. And so he says, <laughs> you know, you've got to listen to me. But Daniel stood his ground. He said, there's no way I'm, I'm not going to go after this food that's been forbidden. I'm not going to go against the law of Moses. Number two, there was a good chance that the meat that they were being served had first gone and been set before an idol. And he says, I'll starve to death before I eat this thing. He said, well, I, I can't have that. Is there a compromise? He goes, yeah, I want, why don't you give us 10 days? Just 10 days. I don't go before the king for a while. Let's just see how we look after this period. And, and if it's not working, I'll be the first to say. So the guy said, okay, well, let's try that. And you guys know how it turns out. Of course, they look much better than the other teens that were there now kind of getting the love handle from stuff, from eating all this stuff. And, 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 and aren't functioning as well in school be, because they've been drinking this wine and stuff. And he says, okay, well, if you guys look this good, let's put everyone on the same regiment. So this was a, a huge deal. Daniel 1 and verse 19 says, the king talked with them after they'd gone through this period and found none equal to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And so they entered the king's service. And in every manner of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters in his whole kingdom. So the wisdom and discernment that, that they would have would soon be put to the test. But they have, they have been put before the king, and the Lord has told them, you are, just be faithful to me. And so he's asked them to be faithful, and then he gives them this blessing of discernment. And he tells them, I want you to use this to, to my good. And I want you to use this and walk in my ways. And so in chapter 2, after they've been faithful and after they've practiced discernment, in chapter 2 we see an incredible story that Lincoln read a part of where King Nebuchadnezzar has this awesome dream. And so it, it's keeping him up at night. It's a reoccurring dream. And so he brings in all the wise men from the nation. He said, guys, I, I've got this thing that's keeping me up at night. Can you help me? Can, can you decipher it for me? They're like, absolutely. 
uh, just tell us what it is and, and we'll come up with an answer. And the king's like, well, you know what? I don't think that's going to work because anyone can, can kind of spitball an answer. How am I going to know if this is even legit? Yeah. Uh-huh. Sure. Sure. Uh, just to stop for a minute, if if we can gather around them, um, and if you would be great, right over be great. Them this morning, so can you guys stand up, and we can I'll surround them. Lay a hand on them. Let's pray together. Father, there there is a reason we come to worship, and there is a, a reason that we spend time in your word. And there is is reason why we want to be shaped, the reason why we want to be different. There's a reason that we come together to stand out and, Lord, like Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, to truly be different. And, Lord, it's encouraging to come together to learn from your word and, and Lord, to, to realize the path that you lay out before us. But, Lord, there's also another reason that we come not just be shaped by you, but also to be shaped by the community that you've called us to be a part of. And Lord, what that means is is that we become family and we become brothers and sisters. And and sometimes, Lord, the the connections we have within the church family sometimes are, are, are many times stronger than our own flesh and blood. And so, Lord, this is a people that we covenant with It's a people that we say we're going to walk through life together. We're going to celebrate when folks get jobs. We're going to celebrate with new births. But Lord, we're also going to mourn and we're going to surround each other. And we're going to walk through the darkest days of living in this life, in this fallen world. Lord, it means so much because we have no idea what, what befalls us tomorrow, the next day, the next month. Well, Lord, we have confidence that you're faithful. and We have confidence that we have brothers and sisters that care for us deeply, that have a connection that the world can't understand. And Lord, for the LaCroix family, they are hurting. They don't understand. But Lord, they come here seeking answers from you. They also seek comfort from you, and they seek comfort from this family. Lord, may we surround them and remind them of the community, and also remind them of the hope that we have for life beyond this life for all of us. We pray this in Jesus' most precious name. Amen. King Nebuchadnezzar tells the wise men, not only do you have to discern the dream, you've got to tell me what the dream is. And and here's the deal I'm making with you. If if you can tell me what's been going through my mind, and and if if you can enlighten me on that, and tell me what it means, I'm going to bless you with riches. I'm going to bless you with gifts. I'm going to honor your name among the, the people. But if you can, I'm going to cut you into a million pieces and, and, and turn your houses to rubble and kind of take you out. So that, that, that's kind of the deal. What, what do you think? And they're like, that, this is unrealistic. It's not fair. No man can do this. Apparently, Daniel was not among 
the, the people, but King Nebuchadnezzar says, you wise men, get ready, because if you can't come up with an answer, it's over. I, I'm, I'm going to take you out. And so Daniel gets word about this. So he goes home and he talks with his roommates, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He said, well, this is what's going on. I've been lumped in with these wise men. Uh, my life's on the line. I, I just need you guys to pray. I, I need you to intervene on me. And so the four of them got down on their knees and they said, Lord, this situation we found us, you know what's going on. Please give us this answer. The text tells us, then they went to sleep. So Daniel's, uh, he's facing execution in the morning, sleeping like a baby. He goes and just lays down. Daniel 2, verses 10 through 11, the astrologer has answered the king, there's no man on earth who can do this, what the king is asking. No one can reveal to the king except the gods, and they don't live among men. So Daniel didn't panic. Daniel 2, in verse 47, he goes before the king, and he says, well, th this is what your dream is, and this is what it means. Then the king said to Daniel, Surely your God is the God of gods and the Lord of kings and the revealer of mysteries. For you were able to reveal this mystery. You have the ruler of the free world, the most powerful person in existence at this day, taking a knee, so to speak, and with his language saying, Your God is like something I've never seen, something I've never experienced. I know by my actions, I tried to show that your God was inferior. I'm now seeing firsthand. I wouldn't have experienced if it not through you. Daniel, there's something unique about you. There's a spirit that's going on that I can't understand because I've never seen it, even among, among my wise men. So you've got him pro proclaiming the power of Yahweh. If we're obedient and we're discerning in how we're living, God's going to be faithful and he will allow others that do not know him to glorify God through our witness. Finally, the young men continued trusting. Not only is Daniel given a, a raise in this honor that the king promised, Daniel goes in and he says, I, I've got some friends, and as long as you're promoting me, my first act is I want to promote them as well. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, you know, they're the guys that I kind of roommates with. Uh, can you give them more prominent positions within the kingdom as well? So Daniel stays in the palace, but these guys go out in, into the kingdom. And so if you know anything about the, the dream that, that he brings, and Daniel interprets this of this giant statue that has these various different things. And so in his mind, he's like, I've got to do this statue. And so one of the most familiar stories in all of Scripture, he builds this 90-foot high statue, I'm sure in his likeness. And he invites all the government workers, the, the city traps, the magistrates, the governors and judges, and he brings them all together for this unveiling. And I imagine this, this giant statue, and it's got a sheet over it. And he says, oh, okay, you guys are, are on the dole, so you've got to come to this thing. And so he gets them all out there. He said, all right, we, we have the, the band here. And when they all start cranking up, you hear the horn section, and they pull this thing down. I want everyone to bow down and lift up holy hands and, and to this giant image. I'm sure some of the folks there are, are kind of wrestling with this and, and saying, oh, okay, um, this lifting of holy hands is a literal thing or just a matter of preference. I'm not kind of sure here. But sure enough, the brass section belts out the tomb, the sheet comes down, and all the people fall to their knees except three young men. So everyone's like, what are you doing? Get down, get down. They said, no, we're, we're not going to do it. So they're brought before the king. The king is furious. He said, don't you know what the penalty for this is? You can be thrown into the fire. Daniel 3 and verse 17 is one of the most powerful passages. If we're thrown into blazing furnace, then the God we serve is able to save us from it. And he will rescue us from your hand, O king. But even if he doesn't, even if the cancer isn't cured, We want you to know, O king, that we're not going to serve your gods or worship the image of gold that you have set up. So these three trusting Jews, fully confident of Yahweh's response, but even if Yahweh chooses not to respond in the way that they said that he, he powerfully can, their resolve is not weakened. And so they agree to remain strong. And it was at this point where you've got a king that's invested all this time, all these resources 
into these three young men, and he knows he's failed. He knows everything they've been trying to do hasn't worked. The passage in verse 19 says he was furious, furious that he wasn't able to get through to them. And so he sends them off to their death. But God was faithful in their deliverance. Daniel 3 and verse 28. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted him. Listen to this and defiled the king's command and were willing to give up on their lives rather than to serve or worship any god except their god. When we get to that, folks, when we get to that place in our lives where it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter if we're going to live, it doesn't matter if we lose our job, it doesn't matter what happens. We get to that point where our life means nothing. Lord, it's better to be with you, but if you want me to stay here, I'm going to keep serving and proclaim the name of Jesus. We get to that part. We get to that place. We're no longer fearful to go in to Africa to serve. We're not worried about losing our lives. Our lives mean nothing. We can totally pour ourselves out. We no longer fear what people think about us. We're not worried about someone accepting us or not because we've sacrificed everything. You get to that point, they no longer have power over you. They failed miserably. If you keep reading, you'll see that 70 years later, Practically his whole life served in a foreign country. Daniel still bowing down towards Jerusalem, praying to the God of Israel. Lord, as long as you're going to leave me here, I'm going to keep prophesying and saying what you'd have me to do. So this book is so encouraging to me, especially since some of the stuff we've been through, where God's been trying to get to his people. God got to these four young men. God got to them. And this book answers the question, how do we as believers remain faithful to God in an overwhelmingly secular society we find ourselves in? Young people, keep reading this book. Read about the faithfulness of Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. This story illustrates that godly people can survive and they can thrive if you continue to obey the teachings of God, if you use discernment and pray for His Spirit to guide you and trust Him always. This morning, for each of us, as we wrestle with different things, perhaps there's some that are struggling with faithfulness. And you're still worried. You're still worried about what people think about you. You're worried about what your neighbors and coworkers and fellow students. And you would rather be accepted than to be bold. And if, if, if you're struggling with trusting in God, I, I've been faithful up to this point, but I don't know how much longer I can keep trusting that he's going to provide the things he says he's going to provide. I want you to hang in there. Our shepherds will be available after service, and certainly the staff's available as well. Find someone to talk with. We want to give you the opportunity to talk and to share your story and for us to pray with you and hopefully chart a new path for your life. Whatever we can do for you, please, we want to all live lives that proclaim the glory of our Heavenly Father. I want you to know that I want you to know that I'm honored and humbled to be a member of this church. Uh, God is praised here in creative, personal, meaningful ways. God is known here. His grace, His love, His Spirit. God has served here in ever increasing, fervent ways. Diversity of thought is encouraged here. An act of pursuit of God, which often includes difficult questions, is welcomed here. Doubt, confusion, struggles, they're not shunned here. God's Spirit is at work in us and through us. A long-term and consistent support of serious family crises that have come up has been demonstrated. And it demonstrates our love, but more importantly, more importantly, it demonstrates God's love and the hope that we find in him. The LaCroix family is going to need our help. They're going to need our support. More than that, they're going to need to know God loves them. They're going to need to see the hope that's there. And I know, because I've seen it in you, you know, your guys are going to be there for them. If any of you need to speak with a shepherd, 
concerning struggles you may be having. We'll be available right out this door here to encourage you, to pray with you, to listen. Uh, and, and if not now, if it's 2 in the morning Thursday night or if it's next Saturday afternoon or whenever it is, call on us. Sovereign God, we thank you for who you are, for being reminded of your power, for your timeless movement history, and for the courage you bring to individuals in moments of challenge and crisis. Thank you for your servants today who have brought us great reminders. Thank you for the brothers and sisters to our left and our right, in front and behind us, the song and handshakes, the smiles and encouragement. And now in our departure, God, may your spirit descend on us and empower us to be benevolent and courageous, determined, faithful in all we do, that your kingdom and your church may, even by what is done here today, be spread further. In Jesus' name, amen.